All right, good evening and welcome to the Thursday, June 8th meeting of the Santa Monica Rent Control Board on its regular night. Uh, this is our call to order. May we have the roll? Yes, Commissioner Gwynn. Here. Commissioner Ivanov. Here. Commissioner Gonska. Here. Chair Foster. Here. Did you call oh, Commissioner Leslie? I'm sorry, uh, Vice Chair Leslie is not with us at the moment. Thank you. All right, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If everybody will take a moment to review the minutes, if you haven't already, you may have an advance. Uh, if you have, entertain a motion to accept the minutes from the last meeting. I move that we approve the minutes. I second that. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. I'll accept the minutes from the last meeting. Thank you. Moving on to item six, special agenda items. When we get to hear from our wonderful executive director, Tracy Condon. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. I have a couple of announcements tonight. Um, near the end of June, we'll be sending our regular summer mailing to all property owners and tenants of controlled rental units. Uh, the owner's mailing will include the maximum allowable rent reports, and this year we'll be including the adjusted MAR per measure RC. So that's the August 2022 MAR with the 3% or maximum $70 added to it. And that's the amount to which this year's general adjustment will be applied. So they will receive the adjusted MAR and the general adjustment in the new MAR. Tenants this time are going to receive a newsletter format for the summer mailing, and they will also receive that information, the adjusted MAR and the new MAR. So the summer mailing will be personalized to uh, the, res the rental units for the first time. Uh, we haven't done it that way before, but this year, because of Measure RC, uh, we thought that was the best way to do it so people understand um, that the rent, the general adjustment's not being applied to the rent that they're currently paying, probably in most cases. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the registration fee bills will be mailed uh, near the last week of June. Uh, those need to be paid by property owners by August 1st in order for them to be in compliance with the law and to be able to increase the rents and pass through half of the registration fee to tenants as a $9.50 surcharge on their rent. Um, we encourage people to uh, pay by online uh, that will ensure that their payment is received. Uh, the envelopes that the registration fee bills come in will have a QR code that somebody can use to easily access the site to pay online either by uh, e-check or credit card. So, and that's all I have this evening. Thank you, and we just want you to pass along to staff uh, our deep admiration and thanks for this Herculean task that we know came along with the administration of Measure RC. It's never, it's never a small thing to ask staff to, to take on a huge rule change or a one-time Yeah, it's been a big change thing. this year, but it's important that we get the information out. So I think it was Mr. Costello's idea to do the newsletter format for the tenants and provide both of those rents, and I think that's a really good idea. So are those, those are going to be on the same document? I mean, the yes. newsletter is the The newsletter the is the mailing to the tenants. And what kind of um, public outreach are you doing to make sure that mm -hmm. tenants know that they should be looking for this? We will be doing, do you want to speak to that, Mr. Costello? And the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Commissioner Leslie's not here right now, but the newsletter will have on it in three different languages the fact that all of that information is available in Amharic, Spanish, and Farsi. But do you want to talk about the outreach? Reach around your microphone, please. Thanks. Good evening. So, uh, yeah, we are coordinating with the city's communication office, and we'll be sending out um, 
uh, on all the city's social channels uh, an announcement of the GA. Uh, that should go tomorrow, uh, the worst case Monday. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to um, have that included in SAML News, which has a very large subscriber base. Um, we're going to uh, do email blasts both to our mailing list and to the city's list. Um, I think that covers everything, yeah. Thank you, yeah. I've, I like mailing to all the tenants and owners. Right. So. I've been hearing from some constituents that, who are just this moment re receiving rent raises, at, you know, just kind of out of nowhere. So, so they're just kind of wondering where does their average kind of fall, or, and so we're just encouraging them to call, call your staff and, and look at it one by one when that does happen. Thank you so much. All right, on to item seven, public comment. It's a request for members of the public to speak on any issue uh, that's within the board's subject matter jurisdiction, but not on the current agenda. And state law prohibits the board from taking any action on items not listed on the agenda. Uh, we have Michael Millman has requested to speak under public comment. Uh, you requested five, but public comment is a limit of three. Okay. Go right ahead. Good evening, Madam Chair. This is sort of a bittersweet appearance. Where do I start, Tracy Condon? You have been an unbelievable, amazing, irreplaceable feature in the landscape of Santa Monica rental housing for a very long time. We don't have to talk about your incredible and outstanding intelligence or your uh, college background from University of Michigan. She is very compassionate with never giving an inch up to not protecting tenants. If you ask her for a document, she doesn't tell you, well, why don't you go down at the corner and wait? She'll send it to you. If you have a big issue that's very important to owners and tenants, she'll arrange a meeting. We may not have gotten any uh, success at that meeting, but she always had the courage to set and staff that meeting. Years and years we spent together doing some pie chart. I, I, I don't even know what that was, only Lima did. I'm going to miss you, but I'm going to miss your, com your compassion. I'm going to miss your heart. I'm going to miss the fact that you are genuinely drop dead, absolutely a nice, charming, decent person to everybody to everybody, including people that provide housing. So you'll do wherever you go or whatever you do, you'll do well. But I personally could not have done what I had to do on behalf of landlords without you bolstering me and helping me. You are a gem. So if I went to Tiffany's and asked them for the very best diamond, <laughs> They'd say you better go to the rent control board and ask for Tracy Condon because her brilliance and her cut and her weight is beyond what Tiffany's or Cartier could have. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me. Thank you very much, Mr. Millman. That's very nice of you. But I'm not going anywhere right away. I'm going to be here for probably another six months or so. But thank you. All right. Thank Appreciate you. that. Very nice, Michael. <clears throat> All right. Well, gosh, how how do we how do we follow that up? On to jurisdictional items. All right, no, but in all seriousness, uh, we do have an appeal to hear tonight. Um, item ten a one, case two five three two two five twenty Pacific Street Unit One. The applicant is Pacific One LLC. The owner. Can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, commissioners. Under the rent control law, if a landlord believes that a tenant is using their unit only as a, a secondary residence, they can petition the board to find the tenant not in occupancy under Regulation 3304. And um, if the evidence shows that the unit is no longer the tenant's residence of usual return, which is a term that's defined under regulation, um, based on various factors, then the rent can be increased based on comparable market rates. Um, here the landlord alleged that uh, tenant Ms. Pamela DeLiz 
um, who's lived in her unit for over 30 years, is no longer occupying it as her residence of usual return. The hearing officer found that the record showed otherwise and denied the petition and the landlord has appealed. Um, the record in, contains uncontroverted evidence that Ms. Deliz uses uh, the apartment as her mailing address with and registering her address with various government agencies, and it's also where she receives uh, her utility bills. Uh, the hearing investigator uh, contacted Ms. Deliz and two days later inspected the um, her apartment and found it to be uh, consistent with um, her occupancy of it as her uh, residence. It, it was fully furnished. Um, it contained many personal items. Um, there was perishable food in the refrigerator. The bathroom was fully stocked, so it appeared as if she lived there. Um, the Ms. Deliz also um, owns uh, three or owns or, or co-owns three properties back east and the record sh uh, showed that she does not have a homeowner's exemption on file within any of those states for any of those properties. In fact, she, what she did uh, say that she has is that she files a renter's credit with the state of California for her Santa Monica apartment. To prove that Ms. Deliz doesn't stay in her, her apartment, um, the landlord submitted the testimony of a couple of witnesses. One was an upstairs neighbor, and the other was the asset manager of the landlord who frequents the property. And both testified that they hadn't uh, rarely seen, they had rarely seen Ms. Deliz over the last two years. Um, but Ms. Deliz uh, credibly testified, which is what the hearing officer found, that she uh, adhered very strictly to the rules of COVID isolation during this period, and we were talking about the height of the pandemic in the last couple of years that was uh, reviewed, and um, that also she had great concern living it by herself um, with crime situation in Santa Monica, and therefore she uh, kept her curtains closed, um, which is one of the things that the uh, witnesses for the landlord had pointed out. She keeps her curtain closed even when she's in the unit to uh, out of safety. Um, and so the hearing officer reasoned that that's that would explain why those witnesses had not seen Ms. Deliz over that time. Um, the, what, the asset manager also uh, testified that she had reviewed security camera footage and she said that she had not seen Ms. Deliz in the security camera footage, but then she also conceded that she had only looked at the footage on a periodic basis and for that reason the hearing officer didn't give it much weight in considering the evidence. Uh, the record shows that Ms. Deliz has been away for substantial periods of time over the last couple of years uh, for travel for work, to take care of a friend who was uh, sick with COVID. And most significantly, she has been away for about three months um, in late summer, early fall in both 2021 and 2022 on a road trip back east to visit those properties that I mentioned and to conduct necessary repairs to them. Uh, the regulation actually uh, excuses certain temporary extended absences such as these, whether it's for travel for work or for, for providing emergency care, similar kinds of absences. Given that evidence and that record, um, substantial evidence supports the hearing officer's conclusion that Ms. Deliz continues to occupy her apartment as a residence of usual return, and for that reason, staff recommends that the board affirm the decision and its findings of fact and conclusions of law. Thank you for that. Let me ask you uh, a, qu a clarifying question about your report. Uh, isn't it, is it also true that tenants in apartments, that is their home, it's their primary home, and they take vacations, they take sabbaticals, they do things just like any any other citizen uh, of the world does, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they've abandoned their unit. Isn't that correct? That's exactly what the regulation actually specifies, are the th two of the examples that you provided. Other examples that are in the regulation include military service, where people can be away for years. So the regulation does take into consideration that for various reasons, people can be away from their apartment for extended periods of time without having actually, as you put it, abandoned it or stopped using it as their residence of usual return, which is how the regulation puts it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions for staff? All right, we do have one request to speak on this item. It's the tenant uh, answering this request for appeal, Pamela Deliz. 
You have up to five minutes. Good evening. My name is Pamela DeLise, and I am the occupant of Unit 1 at 520 Pacific Street in Santa Monica, and have, that has been my home for more than 30 years, since February 1st, 1993. In addressing you this evening, I would like to explain to the board my personal experiences in dealing with the current landlord over the past four plus years while residing at Unit 1, 520 Pacific Street. It has become obvious to me that an essential part of my landlord's business model is to transform Santa Monica rent control units into market rate units. As the longest term lowest rent control tenant living in my building, I am the most obvious target for their efforts. My landlord's LLC took possession of my building in January 2019, and since taking possession, my landlord's actions have been calculated to coerce me to relinquish my tenancy. I was not the only person that this happened to. As a result, I have been living under siege in a hostile living environment and have been subject to constant prying and scrutiny of my private life and business affairs poisoning the landlord-tenant relationship and creating an unpleasant and acrimonious atmosphere. Under these circumstances, I have not been permitted to enjoy the peaceful and quiet enjoyment of my home, even though I clearly occupy the unit and have fully complied with all terms of my rental agreement, including paying my rent on time and being a responsible tenant. Over the past four years, uh, I have found this a wholly unpleasant experience to be extremely emotionally stressful. These uh, actions on the part of my landlord have caused me significant anguish and emotional distress, distress. This latest action of dragging me before the Santa Monica Rent Control Board to prove my occupancy initially began in September 2021. And that has resulted in me having to waste inordinate amounts of time and effort to counter the false claims put forth by my landlords. This has significantly impacted the time available to me to devote to my business activities in my ongoing efforts to support myself as a single woman. My landlords and their legal representatives have attempted to mislead the Santa Monica Rent Control Board in furtherance of their attempts to almost triple my monthly rent to a level that they anticipated would be prohibitively expensive to me and in order to coerce me to vacate my Santa Monica home of more than 30 years. I am fortunate that I was able to submit enough documentary evidence that I was able to, to the hearing officer, that I was able to thwart their plan. I have already submitted a five-page written rebuttal to the board addressing uh, each of these specific false claims by, made by my landlord's attorneys as put forward in the appeal of the Rent Control Board dated February 8th, 2023. I hope that each commissioner has the opportunity to review my written responses rebutting the fabricated claims contained in the landlord's appeal and to understand that this is a, a case which could be a study case. Needless to say, I fully agree with the hearing officer's determination that the evidence that I submitted uh, confirms that I do occupy my Unit 1 apartment at 520 Pacific Street and ask that you deny my landlord's current appeal to the contrary in your vote. I would like to, at this time, thank the Santa Monica Rent Control Board and staff, including Ms. Lima, and taught for the time and resources extended throughout the process, even though it's been very difficult, as well as the board hearing that you're holding today. And I thank you for your attention and consideration in this unfortunate matter. And I, I'll leave you with one thing. I chose to fight, and I had the resources and education to fight. But there's many people that are in my age bracket, I'm a senior, that don't. And I am still very worried about them being bullied into something that they simply would just leave with their tail between their legs, and it would be a terrible injustice for rent control in this city. 
Thank you so much. Any questions? I don't see any for you at this time. You can have a seat. Thank you so much. All right, we will enter discussion. Does anybody have an opening comment in this case? All right, seeing none, I will just say uh, thank you uh, to the uh, defendant of this uh, appeal who showed up and, and was quite eloquent in your comments and in your written submissions. So thank you for taking the time to come to your to somebody else's appeal. <laughs> Very nice. Um, as we stated earlier during the questions for the staff, uh, it's my opinion, fellow commissioners, that a tenant's domicile is their home. And it's no different than any homeowner or anybody else. Uh, if they're in compliance with their lease and the terms of their lease, um, you know, it's unfortunate that, that sometimes the tools of the board are used in this way. However, uh, Everything was heard, and I think justice was served. So uh, I move that we accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law from the original hearing and deny this appeal. Second. You call the roll, please. Yes, Commissioner Gonska. Yes. Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie? Yes. Chair Foster? Yes. Motion carries. All right. All right. Uh, moving on to item 11. We have a couple of important uh, public hearings tonight and administrative items left to go here. Item 11A, consideration of imposing a $67 ceiling on the 2023 general, general adjustment of 2.8%. May we have a staff report? Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, this is before you tonight to decide whether to impose a ceiling on the 2023 general adjustment. Uh, the board announced this public hearing at the last meeting, at the last meeting, and so now it is before you. Um, this year, the ceiling, if you choose to impose it, would be $67. You can see the methodology that's used in the staff report, and that is according to the charter. So it's the same methodology every year. Um, and this year, the $67, if it's imposed, would apply to all units with MARS of 2,375 and above. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, we have no request to speak on this item, so we will enter uh, discussion. I have a quick question for staff. Um, isn't it true that in the last 22 years of GAs since Costa Hawkins phase in that this board of various makeups over the years has uh, exercised the options that the citizens gave us in Measure GA and, and before in a manual calculation to set such a ceiling ex in all years except for three? Since 2020 or 2000? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Since 2000, um, the board has not applied a ceiling in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2007, 2008, and 2010, and 2013. Since Measure GA passed in 2012, it's just been the one year that the board did not apply the, the ceiling. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, any uh, items for discussion? All right, Commissioner Ivanov. What was the justification for all of those years in the early 2000s and 2007, 8 for why the board opted not to set the cap? You know, I don't remember each year, but I think in some years the general adjustment was very small, like 1% or less than 1%. Um, I can't really say what I can't, I don't recall 
exactly. Well, it's, it's been a long time. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think the financial crisis is rep is reflected in a couple of those and years and 2012. Yeah. And uh, the early 2000s was I we did check into this was also a time of very low, uh, almost record low inflation. So um, low general adjustments. Right. Yeah. All right, uh, Commissioner Gonska. Do you have handy the um, what the G, the general adjustments were in those years when they when the cap was not yeah implemented? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, just looking since Measure GA passed, which is the formula that we're now using to calculate the ceiling. Um, in 2013, when the board did not apply a ceiling, it, the general adjustment was one percent. In 2010 which was obviously before Measure GA, it was 2%. In 2008, it was 2.7%. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other requests to speak? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Uh, Commissioner Leslie, Vice Chair Leslie. I would like to make a motion that we place a cap of $67. I second that. All right. We have a motion and a second. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Commissioner Gonska. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie. Yes. Chair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. All right. Ceiling has been set. Thank you for that discussion. And uh, on to item 11B, consideration and adoption of the Rent Control Board fiscal year 23-24 operating budget. <clears throat> All right. All right, so tonight the board um, is scheduled to hold a public hearing, although I don't see anybody here to speak. Um, you did receive a couple of written communications, well, but they were not about the budget. They were about the general adjustment. Um, so the board reviewed the budget um, and agency goals in a study session on May 23rd. <clears throat> At that time, the board asked staff to reconsider whether there were adjustments that could be made to the budget um, to reduce the projected deficit at that time of approximately $33,000. Fortunately, the hearings department has been developing a plan to reduce the time from petition filing to decision issuance on decreased petitions. And by implementing a process change at the beginning of the fiscal year, we project that we would be able to reduce our as-needed expenses for mediations by um, $21,500. So we've modified the budget um, to reduce the as-needed allocation. And the board also discussed measures to increase revenue. Uh, we've updated a goal in the area of ensuring compliance with the rent control law to state that the agency will proactively pursue payment of unpaid registration fees and um, will monitor owner-occupied fee waivers granted to multifamily properties. These efforts in combination with our ongoing owner-occupied exemption monitoring and the registration of newly created um, accessory dwelling units that were created by conversion of space uh, should result in the increase of billable units both sometime during the coming year <clears throat> and for next year. Although we don't know how much we'll be able to collect in back uh, registration fees, we had already built into into the budget about 6,000 projected revenue for that. We're conservatively adding an additional 3,000 to that projection. So that um, allows us to reduce the projected deficit to less than $9,000, which is essentially a, ba a balanced budget. Um, because we covered the budget in detail during the study session, um, I'm just gonna give a very brief summary for the upcoming fiscal year, we're projecting operating expenditures of $6,138,000 and revenue of approximately $6,130,000, <clears> resulting in essentially, as I said, a balanced budget with a small deficit of less than $9,000. If the de deficit remains at the end of the fiscal year, that will be covered by the board's reserve. The annual uh, per unit registration fee is the agency's main source of revenue and it will remain $228 for the coming year just as it was in the current year. 
And as I mentioned <clears throat> in the announcements, owners who pay the fee by August 1st and are, are otherwise in compliance with the law can pass through half of that fee to the tenants as a $9.50 uh, monthly surcharge. <clears throat> the budget does include one-time expenses this year of approximately $320,000. More than half of that total is for the partial reimbursement uh, to long-term employees uh, of contributions they made toward a retirement benefit that was discontinued by the city in 2020. A smaller reimbursement of that nature will occur next fiscal year. The other one-time expenses are costs associated with anticipated retirements of long-term employees. As you heard um, Mr. Millman's comments, I informed the board um, and staff recently that I'll be retiring by the end of the year. And so it's been an honor and a pleasure to work for the Rent Control Agency for 36 years. And it was a very difficult decision to make. But having made it, we did build some one-time costs into the budget, including money for an executive recruiter if the board chooses to hire an executive recruiter to assist with the recruitment. Um, we also have included funds to allow for a, a couple of months of overlap with myself and the new executive director. And the other uh, portion of that is other costs related to retirements. Um, in addition to the operating expenses, the board's fiscal year 23-24 budget includes one non-operating expense. Uh, that's the seventh payment on the loan that the city made to the board in 2017 to accelerate paying down of the agency's unfunded pension liability. The board previously approved these expenditures. It's a 10-year plan, and this is the seventh payment. <clears throat> so the budget maintains the current operations of the agency and ensures the provision of the highest level of public service in our day-to-day -day operations. So since we do not have anybody here to speak tonight, um, unless the board has questions, you can open the public hearing and close the public hearing and then vote on the budget. But before you do that, I want to thank Ms. Noseworthy again for her excellent work on the budget. She works very hard on this. And as you, have, those of you who have been around have seen, she's very accurate in her projections. And I really appreciate all the hard work she puts into it. So I want to thank her. We will open the public <clears throat> hearing. Uh, members of the public uh, did not attend uh, this public hearing, so we shall close it and enter. Can we just have a little bit of discussion or questions? Of course. Yes. Uh, I don't see any names in the queue. Uh, Commissioner Ivanov. Out of the uh, the one-time expenses, um, I, I know you mentioned the recruiting effort in terms of retaining a recruiter. Mm -hmm. Do we have a ballpark, just just the recruiter alone, how much that is going <clears> to? <throat> I think cost? that could be between thirty-five and $40,000. Commissioner Gonska. I just wanted to briefly say thank you for uh, taking the last uh, few weeks since our last meeting to take another look through the, the budget to reduce that deficit. We really do appreciate that. I know we had an extensive conversation on that uh, last meeting, and you had a very short period of time to uh, to find things that were realistic, that weren't just moving around numbers mm -hmm. for the sake of getting to a, a sort of a messaging point. Uh, and I think that uh, I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate uh, all the work you put in every year to be so accurate on that. Um, I think this budget is in a, a very good place, and uh, I think that it, we have an actual opportunity also to end up uh, in the black, uh, despite even the very uh, minor uh, projected deficit. So thank you. Commissioner, Le Vice Chair Leslie. I also concur. I'd like to say thank you as well. Um, it was a quick turnaround, and you guys put in a lot of work. I know it's how much work it takes. I do this in my day job, so I definitely know how much, and I can really appreciate your number crunching in the way that you've done it, in a way that it does not impact those that need to be, you know, service to our community. Thank you. 
I'd just like to say I'm sorry that Miss Maddie Daub isn't here tonight because she really was the one who said we can make this change and we can make it at the beginning of the year and this will allow us to reduce the cost. So I really attribute the change to her and Ms. Noseworthy. So you took the, the words right out of my mouth. Um, I was going to say it's it's a terrible shame that Tracy's not here because I unfortunately had to leave that meeting early before <laughs> um, this discussion was had. Uh, there were just the three of you. That's the first budget session I've missed, I think, in seven years. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to my fellow commissioners who uh, recognized something where there might have been at least space to have a discussion about a deficit and see if there is wiggle room, especially in your first year of, of handling the budget. And you discovered what, what we've all known for a while, that our staff is amazing, and when pushed, they respond. Um, a lot of commissions can be very siloed and uh, seen but not heard, and um, we we feel that our staff is incredibly responsive uh, to this Monday morning quarterbacking uh, that we sometimes uh, ask of them. Uh, but yeah, there, there's usually there's room, and uh, almost every budget has some one-time expenses and things. So you actually were really twisting their arm to find uh, this. There were some 320 one-time expenses that they worked into the existing fee structure that we have. And they still, even on top of that, managed to take some um, efficiencies that I think they were planning on finding anyway and finding it sooner, which is no, no easy task. So thank you, Lima. Thank you, Tracy Matty Dobb. Thank you to the entire staff, the legal staff, the information staff, everybody who has to, everyone has to roll up their shirt sleeves and find the, find the efficiencies. So thank you so much for that. Do you need us to take official motion to adopt? Okay. Uh, can I please entertain a motion from somebody to adopt this budget? Yeah, I make a motion that we adopt the budget for the 23-24 um, fiscal year as presented. Is there a second? I second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Commissioner Gonska. Yes. Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie. Yes. Chair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, item 12A, an administrative item to revise the job specification for administrative staff the administrative staff assistant position. Should we have a brief staff report? Yes, thank you. Um, sort of continuing on the theme of efficiency and streamlining, we took a look at our administrative staff assistant position, which is currently vacant, and so we took that opportunity to revise the job spec. And the recommendation, right now that position is currently housed in the legal department, and the recommendation is to now house it in the hearings department to also help um, the hearings department send out notices of hearings and appeals and just improve um, the efficiency of that operation while also performing general office tasks and tasks for the legal department. So that is before you tonight. Can you, so I think I was the only one here uh, when we revised this position just a, just a few years ago to begin with. Can, so every dollar does count, as we just found out in the budget study session, and uh, every staff position counts um, in our service to our tenants and landlords and administering this law efficiently like we've done for 40 plus years. Can you tell us why this job was switched in the first place and, and how that sort of came about? Yeah. Well, I can, I mean, so it had been um, a legal secretary position, and I think at the time the legal division was engaged in a lot more litigation, and as the litigation lessened, the duties of the legal secretary just weren't needed as much. And so it was decided to make that position into the more general administrative staff assistant position so they could still provide support to the legal department while also providing general office support across the agency. And now, um, as we are streamlining some of the hearings department's procedures, um, we're realizing that it also makes a lot of sense for this position to help send out notices and do some of the clerical administrative work for that division as well. 
All right. Any other commentary from the commissioners? Just sure. Executive Director Condon. Um, I just wanted to mention that we did meet with the leadership of the Employees Action Committee. This is a position within the EAC. And although we're not changing uh, the classification or creating a new classification, nor are we changing the compensation assigned to this, out of courtesy we met with them. And that's an important partnership that we have. So I just wanted to mention that. That is worth mentioning. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Leslie. So would this be a position that some of the people that were laid off from the city be able to apply for? It will be an open recruitment, so mm -hmm. certainly anybody would be welcome to apply for it. Okay. Um, the way it has worked within, within the city, and we haven't filled a position for a while, but we'll put the notice out, and if there are a certain number of qualified candidates within the city, um, they could just do a internal uh, exam process. But if there aren't, then it would be open, and, and but everybody submits applications at the same time. So certainly we would encourage anybody who would be interested in the position or working with us to submit an application once we're able to post it. We'll work with HR for that recruitment process. And I have another question. Mm -hmm. Would it be easier for somebody that did work for the city to apply for it? In other words, it would be easier to transition into? Um, I think, I mean, certainly somebody who knows the city processes, you know, that would help them. But I think that anybody could apply for the position. This is the highest level of the clerical positions other than an executive assistant who usually reports directly to a department head. So we're looking for somebody with some really developed um, support and administrative skills. Okay. Thank you. All right, seeing no other discussion, um, this one's simple. I'm just going to move that the board adopt the revised job specifications for the administrative staff assistant position as set forth in attachment A. Is there a second? I second the motion. All right. We call the roll, please. Yes, Commissioner Gonska. Yes. Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie. Yes. Fair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I say we just skip 12B altogether and we just don't talk about it. Can we get Michael back? <laughs> um, things I thought I'd never say. Uh, item 12B, selection of a subcommittee to oversee the recruitment for an executive director administrator. Uh, I believe you said, Tracy, you have some well, thoughts on the matter. Yeah, I can just tell you. Um, the last time the board recruited for an administrator, they did hire an executive recruiter who uh, was very helpful in terms of all of the administrative tasks related to the process. Um, I would, you know, as I said when we were talking about the budget, we've put money for that into the budget. I would very much appreciate if the board would establish a subcommittee of two people who could work with me um, both on selecting an executive recruiter if that's the choice that's made. Um, there will be a brochure that will be prepared that will explain the minimum qualifications that are required and the nature of the job and so the subcommittee would assist with that. Um, Every, all of the board members would be involved in the actual interviewing of the candidates because um, it's a decision that the board makes. Um, this is not a civil service position. It's an at-will position. Um, so there is not a traditional class spec because the class specs like the one you just approved are for positions within the civil service. Uh, but I did... Um, prepare some requirements so I would be talking with the subcommittee about that and in talking with um, one of you this evening I think it would be a good idea if you do establish a subcommittee that the subcommittee could make periodic reports to the board about how things are going and what's going on so that everybody knows what's going on uh, but you know it's much more efficient for a subcommittee to be able to assist me with these types of things because if the whole board did it it would all everything would have to be a public meeting um, and we can more efficiently accomplish this uh, with a subcommittee okay 
Does anyone uh, want to volunteer or have any nominations? Uh, Commissioner Gwynn. Um, do we want to, as a board, before we even, if we decide to do this, pick two people, do we want to set the parameters? I know Tracy's kind of said what the parameters would be for the, the board or for the subcommittee. To me, it would seem like the subcommittee should have carte blanche to do everything that's necessary except the things that need to come to the board. For example, obviously for the interviewing, um, when we decide on a, if we decide on a recruiter to bring that to the board, obviously if a, a job description, I would assume would have to come to the board for approval and those types of things. So is that what we're looking at? Is, is, cause I, it makes sense, as Tracy said, for, the subcommittee to work closely with her and to alleviate needing to come to the as a group meeting in the public every time we had, needed to talk about something are you looking for more specific uh duties from well, tracy I, at this time or what i'm not sure i would just question. say that they would have their duties would be Whatever to do the recruitment needed. process except for the things that need to come to the board and if we do want a periodic report that's fine too but i think that there's certain things that have to come to the board and so I would think that the committee subcommittee would have carte blanche to do what's necessary <clears throat> oh just to advance to the goals it. I yeah. think that makes sense mm -hmm. okay um I certainly would like to volunteer uh for this uh, only because having done this for seven going on eight years I just have a, a deep working knowledge of the commissioner executive director relationship um, the parameters set forth therein and budget considerations duties political considerations uh, community considerations i've worked up and down the state with other jurisdictions that have been seeking rent control spoken on panels about rent control and about our model and so um, you know saving some money on that recruiter could involve some of our knowledge of these other jurisdictions and uh, of other potentially qualified candidates before we would need to do such a huge expenditure on um, an executive recruiter, maybe, but maybe not. So that would be something that that I, for one, would be um, first exploring uh, within a subcommittee. Uh, and I would, oh, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Leslie, your comments? I would like to volunteer as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gwen. Yes. Um, one of the things that um, I think we need to take consideration when we do this chair of uh, the subcommittee is what the city and rent control board has pushed for and pushed for in recent years, and that's for the, um, the um, idea of the uh, inclusivity and diversity and accountability. Um, so I think, and I think we need that throughout the process. And while I feel that any of us would push for that where we appointed, including myself, um, because that's so important, I feel we have on this board now someone who is so involved in that at such a level that none of us can do that. And that's a Vice Chair Leslie. Um, and I just feel that it's necessary for her voice to be in this process from the beginning. And so for that reason, I would um, push for uh, Vice Chair Leslie to be the second person. And I totally agree that um, Chair Foster needs to be on this. I have a comment. Please, Vice Chair Leslie. So I know you said two, but in our selection committee, it was kind of for downtown Santa Monica, it was an odd number. So I would also agree with the odd number and that third person I would agree with being Lonnie Gwynn as well because he knows the ins and the outs. It would From, be a Brown Act group if we had would, more than two. We can't, we have, can't have more than two. Yeah, I would love that. And but, all of our subcommittees have always been two. But three no. people would be a meeting of the board. Yeah, and okay. so every meeting would be public. We're not, big, we're not large enough. <clears throat> but yeah, that's an excellent point Yeah, for sure. Any tiebreakers. <laughs> um, and honestly, uh, within a subcommittee, if there were to be, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if there were to be some sort of failure to, to agree, we could simply come back to the larger board. 
with anything like that. But yeah, it's a fair point. Uh, Commissioner Gonska. Uh, I, I would also very much support uh, you, both of you uh, being on the subcommittee. Um, I think that one thing I would like is, I think it would be, or at least I'm interested in people's thoughts on having a report each board meeting, not to come to us for approval or anything like that. And it doesn't need to be an extensive report. It can be completely verbal. It doesn't even need to be written in my opinion, but just to, uh, just for transparency's sake, uh, because of Brown Act considerations, um, I think we can't even really necessarily, actually we can't even call one of you up to have conversations about a lot of this stuff because you will have already been talking to each other. Uh, so really the only way I think, well, I guess we could talk to staff, but um, but I think it would be useful just to have a, a brief summary of whatever's happened, if anything, of consequence over the, the previous month. Makes complete sense to me. And I think, um, so in my experience on previous subcommittees for various like ballot measures and other things we've done uh, in my time on the board, it, it, it doesn't tend to be that heavy. It, you know, frequent reports are absolutely an, something simply and easily done. Um, and also, setting, setting, the, setting the process by which we will select isn't necessarily some sort of a top secret or, or uh, performative process. It's only in actually voting on who we want to offer a job to. Um, and keeping those confidentialities in close session of, of who the interviewees are and, and whatnot. Those sorts of things are confidential. So it's really not even um, a secretive process or a Brown Act situation mm -hmm. until we get to those steps. So it's, it's of absolutely no problem, um, I think, even to have conversations about what we're thinking. But we would absolutely give regular reports to the board. Um, and I thank you for the votes of confidence in, in both of us. Uh, Commissioner Ivanov. This is more of just a logistical question, and it might be a little early in the process to ask this, but <clears throat> have we envisioned yet how we're going to handle the interview process? Um, because I definitely agree that all, all five of us should be involved in handling it. And if we're navigating Brown Act concerns, are we planning on having the same person interview with five of us individually, or which I think probably doesn't make sense because that will probably overwhelm the applicant, right. right? Well, when we did the recruitment for the general counsel, which is a very comparable um, thing because the board hires directly the administrator and the general counsel. So we solicited applications, we looked to those who were the most qualified, and then we scheduled closed sessions in which the interviews were conducted. So the board as a body interviews the candidates. And then after that can discuss the candidates and invite those back who they would like to for a second interview. That's and how we handled it. Part of the reason we're starting um, so earnestly is because it takes a lot for all five of us in our schedules um, and for staff, relevant staff that needs to be present to observe uh, or help us with these interviews and the interviewees themselves. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite a, a, a large effort to get those calendars to match up. So sometimes days and weeks would go by uh, in between first rounds, for instance, or second rounds. And it, 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 it'll take a while uh, because of that reason. And sometimes, though it was rare, one or two commissioners couldn't make it, you know, to, to a, a potential uh, round of it, which is very unfortunate. We really worked hard, uh, even took extended, you know, extended periods of time to wait for people to all be available. Um, so we, we definitely make every single effort to do that. But in the extreme that we might lose somebody or, you know, by waiting too long. Also, I'd just like to add, um, uh, it's, it's crucially important that this take place in closed session and uh, with the utmost of professionalism. Not that, it, not that I even need to say that to this body. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, other departments in the city have found themselves in some hot water. Um, and, and the applicants deserve uh, the confidentiality of this process to, to remain intact. So that's why we do it that way. And Tracy, you kind of alluded to my next question, but in terms of logistically also how the process is going to work, are we planning on having a bunch of first round interviews and then, you know, let's say we, we want to move like three people forward to the next round and then 
Is that how we're going to narrow it down? or? Yeah, this is really open to the board how they would like to handle it, but yeah. that's how it worked with the general counsel position, yeah. and um, I believe that's that's how it worked in 2007 when the last recruitment occurred for the administrator. Yeah. So uh, it depends on the applicant pool. You know, if there's a very large applicant pool, then you'll look for the most qualified and probably start with them. Uh, and then if you're happy with some of them, you might call those people back. Um, but we'll figure it out as we go along and we see what the responses are. But as uh, Chair Foster said, I mean, the objective is for the board as a body to make this selection. 100%. Uh, the only thing we did do was that the subcommittee um, in, in order to save the boards and the applicants valuable time, because it was so hard to convene six or seven people times five or six or seven or eight or ten applicants, um, the subcommittee did eliminate choices that seemed on their face to not be qualified, rather than waiting and, and submitting every, can, every candidate and every commissioner to that schedule. Um, but that's something we could discuss. And if there were any doubt, among the subcommittee and staff who were helping us, we could bring it forward. Are there any other questions? I think I hear a consensus uh, around Vice Chair Leslie and myself as the subcommittee. We accept, um, and we'll, we'll make you proud. <laughs> and I'll contact we, you to schedule our first we are meeting. Not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Want to go on record? <laughs> not happy about it. This this process, I could easily see this taking five, six years. <laughs> um, all right, that about does it for tonight. Uh, our next meeting will be in two years and six months, <laughs> at which time we will update the rest of the board on our search for a new executive director. <laughs> our next regular meeting will be July 13th, 2023 at 7 p.m. right here. Same channel, same station, same room. Uh, that's it. Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? Can we get me adjourned? We've seen a second. What? Yeah. Yes, I second that motion. <laughs> all right, all in favor, adjournment. Aye. Aye. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>